Good afternoon. Hope you had a good lunch. I uh, hope you're all fresh and ready for some RNA-seq. Uh, so I'll start by talking about myself for a bit. Uh, my name is Fouad Youssef. I'm coming from the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research. Uh, my exposure to RNA-seq comes from three fields or three areas. Um, when I joined OICR, I worked in production and production team. So I was responsible for assembling an RNA-seq pipeline that does the uh, alignment, uh, expression estimation, differential expression, and then uh, QC metrics. And then we pass the out, uh, output files to other teams that would do downstream analysis and more uh, statistics and modeling. I did that for uh, three years, and then after that I was involved in, uh, I moved groups, uh, and I joined a group that does more uh, statistical uh, uh, stuff. Uh, we work on developing biomarkers for cancer, uh, we do a lot of modeling, prediction, classifications. So I used RNA-seq output that I used to generate before into these models and classifications. Uh, and I did that for, for four years. And the third area is teaching. So I've been part of um, CBW for quite a while now. It's been five, five six years. Uh, and um, I mainly teach this workshop, this segment of the workshop. But this segment is actually coming from a more advanced RNA-seq workshop that uh, CBW offers that actually is three days long. So here we're not going to be, uh, we're only going to be covering the basics of RNA-seq uh, just to introduce you to uh, what RNA-seq is and uh, the, the, the main concepts uh, behind RNA-seq and then we'll also have some hands-on exercises. So at the end of the module today you'll be able to run some stuff yourself whether it's alignment, uh, expression or differential expression. So, uh, as I mentioned, these slides are adapted from the, the longer uh, module, which I believe is uh, offered in Toronto uh, in May. You can check with Anne, or you can check the website if you're interested in taking the other one. So, the, uh, the section today is actually divided into two, two parts. So, the first part is going to be about an hour and a half, where I will go over the theory. And then the second part will be hands-on, where we, I picked a data set that is small, and then we will actually run the exercises. We'll go through the exercises for uh, the, the second part. And the first part is actually divided into three sections. Uh, first, I'll go over an introduction to what RNA sequencing is, some challenges that we face in RNA-seq compared to DNA-seq. And then we'll move into alignment, uh, what kind of aligners uh, there are and how they work. And then we'll go over also the output that they generate and do some visualizations. And finally, the, th the third part is expression estimation and differential expression. So here is a more detailed look of the, the first part. Uh, we'll cover the rationale for sequencing RNA, uh, the challenges, as I said, specific to RNA-seq, uh, general goals and themes of RNA-seq workflows, and some technical questions that you'll be faced with when you work with uh, RNA-seq. So for the past couple of days, uh, all you've been working on is uh, DNA. And DNA only solves one part of the puzzle. Uh, there, there are so many other parts that you that you can also use uh, in in coordination with DNA or on on its own to answer so many other questions. And here I'm showing you a schema of uh, the, the central dogma, where we're starting with uh, the DNA, which is what you've been working on, uh, trying to identify SNVs from DNA. Um, but also there is this other layer of information, which is RNA. So all that information in the DNA is uh, is copied into uh, RNA. And by quantifying the RNA, we can actually uh, quantify the expression of those genes, and we can figure out how these genes interact and how they change under different environments. Uh, and then the RNA is actually uh, translated into protein, and that's the functional uh, unit of, of uh, every gene. Now, any RNA se sequencing workflow uh, goes as follows. So you have an experimental, uh, two experimental conditions usually. So for example, here we have tumor and normal, and uh, uh, you want to compare the two, you want to uh, compare the expression levels between the, these two conditions for specific genes. So you, what you do is you isolate the RNA, then you generate cDNA fragments, you sequence uh, using whatever sequencing machine you have, for example, Illumina, and then you take these uh, uh, sequences, you map them, and, uh, and then you try to uh, do, uh, quantify them and do some downstream expression. So that's just an overall uh, 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 overview of the workflow. Now, what can we uh, uh, get from RNA that we cannot get from DNA? What's so special about RNA? 
So RNA is widely used in functional studies. So uh, in functional studies, for example, the genome might be constant. And what's changing uh, and what you're trying to detect is changes in the uh, expression level. And that's not present at the, gen uh, the, gen uh, the genome level or DNA level. So for example, if you're looking at uh, cell lines, uh, drug uh, treated versus untreated cell line, you want to compare the two conditions, you can do that with RNA-seq. Um, also, predicting the uh, transcripts uh, and the structure of the transcript or the sequence of the transcript, so the order of the exons for any specific trans transcript, is really hard to do that uh, to do through uh, DNA. So you will need RNA uh, sequencing to to be able to do that. Um, also, there are some molecular features that are only present at the RNA level, such as alternative uh, isoforms, fusion transcripts, and RNA editing. Um, RNA can also be used to interpret mutations that do not have uh, an obvious effect on the protein uh, sequence. So uh, any mutations that are involved in the regulation of the transcript, that will, uh, RNA-seq will give you an idea, uh, will help you uh, determine those. And also you can use it with uh, DNA-seq. So you can look at all the variants that you just detected uh, this morning and you try to prioritize how important these mutations are by looking at the expression associated uh, with these uh, mutations. So usually what people do, they do DNA-seq and RNA-seq, and then they try to overlap the data to uh, prioritize these uh, mutations. So if you have a, uh, if there is a gene that is not expressed, then the mutation in that gene might not be uh, as interesting. If uh, the gene is expressed, but only the wild type, then that could uh, indicate that there is a loss of function. And finally, if there is a, a, the, mutation, the mutated allele that is actually expressed, and that's really important, because uh, that could suggest that it's a drug, a drug candidate. Um, so there are a lot of things that you can get out of uh, RNA-seq. However, uh, there are a lot of challenges that we face with, uh, with RNA-seq that are not necessarily present in DNA-seq. So some of these challenges are uh, at the sample level, so uh, purity of the sample, uh, the quantity, how much you need in order to do sequencing, uh, and the quality of, of the RNA uh, sample that you're trying to sequence. Um, also the fact that RNA consists of uh, small exons that are uh, uh, spanned by very large uh, in intronic regions. So that's a challenge when you're trying to map that uh, back to, to, the, to the genome. Um, the abundance of the RNA-seq also varies uh, quite uh, a, a bit, um, and, and RNA-seq works by uh, random sampling. So um, if you have a small fraction of highly expressed genes, you want to make sure that they are not actually consuming the majority of the reads, and you're not biasing towards uh, those genes that are uh, piling up to, uh, for, for, some, for some genes. Um, also, the, uh, the length of the RNA differs depending on what type of RNA you're looking at. There are very short RNA uh, that cannot be detected using just a regular uh, RNA-seq protocol. You have to, to have to pick a specific protocol for those. Uh, and uh, for, for very long RNAs, for example, polya selection could, bias, uh, could be biased towards uh, short uh, RNA versus long RNA. So the, the length of RNA is also a challenge that you have to keep in mind. And finally, RNA is very fragile compared to uh, DNA. You can degrade. Uh, we'll go over some methods how you can detect uh, degradation of RNA and uh, how, how, what, you, what you can do about it to resolve it. So we're going to walk through the process of RNA uh, sequencing from uh, step one, which is uh, you get the sample and you're asked to do the sequencing. The first thing you need to do is you make sure that the quality of the RNA is good. So one way you can do that is by looking at the RIN number. Um, just to show of hand, I, I should have that, uh, asked that first. How many people have actually worked with RNA-seq data? Great, wow, a lot of people. Um, and how many people have worked with uh, RNA-seq data where the reference is available? So uh, human genome or perfect. How many people are working with RNA-seq data where the reference is not available? Oh, great, okay. Um, so getting back to this, uh, assessing the quality of the RNA, uh, you can use a, a, a metric called RIN, uh, RIN integrity number, and assess a number or a score that ranges from 0 to 10. Uh, 0 being a very bad quality uh, RNA, and 10 being very high quality RNA. And what you're looking at here, uh, you know that RNA, 80% of the RNA is actually ribosomal RNA. 
Um, and what this technology does, uh, you can think of it as uh, uh, just gel electrophoresis, you're running your RNA through the gel, you're breaking it down, and you're looking at the composition of the RNA. How much of it is ribosomal and how much of, how much of the RNA is not. And here we're looking at two uh, trace plots of uh, two examples where one RNA is really good, the quality is very good, and this is a, a ring number six, which is uh, not terrible. Um, but it's considered bad compared to the REN10. And what we're looking here, we're looking at these two peaks, and these two peaks present the two uh, subunits of the ribosomal RNA. And because they consist 80% of the total RNA, then you see very clear peaks. Uh, and as the quality of the RNA degrades, uh, you're seeing all these uh, peaks uh, that are very similar or comparable to the ribosomal, which shouldn't be the case. Um, now, a lot of times, you have no control over so what sample you get. So you're going to get a sample and you actually get a REN of six and you're asked to do the sequencing. You can say, okay, this REN is low. Can you please give me another sample? But a lot of times you're not going to get an another sample. Yes. Uh, question. Yes. Uh, which REN score is prohibitory for the <laughs> That's, yeah, so that's a very good question. Uh, it's also, th there is no answer because, uh, I mean, you can actually, you can go and sequence a REN of five or REN of four. The, the data you're going to be getting is not a good quality. So you, you are kind of wasting money uh, if you know that the REN is bad. So I would say, um, I would start with, I don't know, seven, eight uh, or higher. Uh, if it's anything lower, then I would request for more. But if you try and push and you can't do it, then um, you've, done, you've done your part. Um, yes. Yes, I think it's bioanalyzer. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, that's a good question. I, it could be the molecular size, maybe. I'm actually not 100% sure. Okay. Yeah, so the two peaks that your large ribosomal subunit and the small ribosomal subunit, they're both kind of yeah, so I got, I'm guessing this is some sort of a sized length or size, and then this would be the fraction. Yeah, yes. Is the rain value was given by the bioanalyzer? Yes, yeah. And I think that the refined values are calibrated for human data. So I was working with the software RNAC, and the rain values were total garbage because you don't get two people, you don't get one because they have a shared data size. So keep that in mind if you're working with. Yeah, yeah. So once you get the RIN number and then you figure out that the quality of your sample is good, uh, then you can move in, move to the next step, which is preparing your RNA-seq library. And um, to do that, there are so many different protocols available out there that you get to choose from. And that really depends on what you're planning to do after. So once you isolate the RNA, as I've mentioned, 80% of the RNA is ribosomal. So you get uh, your to total pool of RNA, and that includes all the RNAs that are available out there, tRNA, mRNA, rRNA. And again, depending on what you need, um, if you want to study ribosomal RNA and you want to look at everything, then you can take that total pool and, uh, and, and, and go ahead, uh, and, and that will contain everything. Uh, if you're only interested in the coding uh, portion, so uh, uh, RNAs, what you can do, there are two different techniques. You can either do uh, a reduction, so you get rid of uh, ribosomal RNA, or you can do a selection, so you only pick the things that you're interested in, so poly A selection. Uh, and each one of these, you will end up with an RNA-seq library. Again, it's very specific to what you are uh, interested in, in doing after. Uh, another thing you have to keep in mind when you're constructing a library is whether or not um, you're going to be doing strand, stranded versus unstranded library. So um, I, I think most of the, uh, the libraries nowadays in RNA-seq, they are stranded. So uh, the whole uh, stranded versus unstranded or, or uh, being able to get stranded information started, I would say, about four or five years ago. And the idea is that previously uh, you were not able to tell whether the reads are coming from the leaving strand or the lagging strand. So you can't really tell if the gene is being transcribed on, on which strand. So you just get reads and you can't tell what, what strand it's coming from, um, like here. But now with, uh, with stranded technology, the way that you construct the library, you should be able to tell if this gene is being expressed on 
one strand or the other strand. So that information is available for you. And that's uh, interesting because you can do allele specific expression. You can do so many other things that you were not able to do uh, previously. Um, and when you look at IGV, uh, IGV I think has, if you look at, you load the gene annotation, it tells you, uh, uh, some, of the, some parts of the gene annotation tell you what, what uh, strand this gene is being uh, uh, transcribed from, and then you can match it with whatever reads that you get to make sure that it's coming from the same, uh, same direction as the annotation. Yes? Yeah, so uh, think of scenarios. For example, if you have two genes that are, uh, that are overlapping, so one gene is being transcribed on one strand, but there is also another gene on the other strand that's also being transcribed in the other direction. This doesn't happen as often in the human genome. It's a very small fraction of genes that actually over overlap. But previously, uh, you would get a mix of both. So you can't really tell where the reads are actually coming from, which gene. Uh, but now with strand information, you can actually separate these two and tell uh, where it's coming from. Um, another thing when you're designing, uh, when you're thinking of designing uh, the RNA-seq experiment uh, replicates, and uh, again, it's one of those things where uh, you are probably going to push to get replicates. Chances are you're not going to get a uh, replicate. Most of the experiments or studies that I've worked with, they, they don't have replicates. Uh, but Again, I also want to emphasize how important replicates are. And when we're talking, about, I'm talking about replicates. I'm talking about uh, technical replicates, and that's um, taking the same sample but running it on multiple lanes on the flow cell, uh, or, or running it on, on uh, multiple days um, to adjust for for these biases or artif artifacts. The other type of replicates that uh, that's also important is biological replicates. So if you're taking a sample from the tumor, uh, maybe you can take another sample that's adjacent uh, uh, and use that as, as a replicate. And that's very important because uh, doing differential analysis on just one replicate is not really a good representation of whatever you're trying to uh, analyze. So uh, after you get replicates, you can just simply look at the correlation, and then uh, if they're highly correlated, that's great. If they're not, then you can go back and figure out why they are not, if there are any other biological uh, factors that are contributing to these differences. Um, so unlike DNA-seq, there are so many more things you can do with RNA-seq uh, data. Once you perform the, the, the sequencing, you prepare the libraries, um, you can do expression. You can do uh, differential expression. You can look at the uh, alternative expression. Um, uh, you can do transcript discovery and annotation, uh, allele-specific expression, just like I, sent, I said with the strand-specific, uh, mutation discovery, fusion detection, RNA editing, and in addition, you can combine that with other data sets as well. Um, so the, the general workflow uh, uh, goes like this. You, once you uh, uh, prepare the library and you sequence it, you get the reads. Uh, you take the raw reads and usually use an aligner. We'll talk about the different types of aligners. But the idea is you take an aligner, you align it either to the transcriptome or uh, a genome, and you uh, take those and then you quantify those reads using uh, another uh, tool that we'll also talk about. And once you take these quantifications, you, you uh, normalize them somehow. We'll talk about that again. And then you pass these uh, uh, numbers uh, at the gene level or the exon level or the transcript level to uh, downstream analysis uh, to perform uh, visualization uh, uh, and, and, and so on, to generate heat maps. <clears throat> so um, now we're going to cover some of the most common questions that you will probably be asking yourself or other people are going to be asking you uh, when you deal with uh, RNA-seq. Um, one of the first questions uh, that uh, I, I get asked is, should I remove duplicates for uh, RNA-seq? Um, it's, um, it's, it's an interesting question. So uh, the, the, app, the, the concept of PCR duplicates was actually briefly mentioned uh, here uh, this, this morning. So, so I, I assume that you know how PCR uh, dupli duplicates are, uh, uh, what they are. So when, with DNA sequencing, what you expect when you uh, fragment the DNA and then do the sequencing, you expect uh, the fragments to overlap. Uh, and you don't expect the reads to pile. 
uh, and have the same start and, and, uh, and, and end. So one way you can resolve that in, in DNA-seq is that you can collapse them. So any reads that have the same exact start point uh, for the first read and end for the second read, uh, you take that pile and you collapse it. So you only, look, you only take one read out of all these reads. However, with RNA-seq, uh, things are a bit different because um, with DNA-seq, the starting points of each of the fragments is random. With RNA-seq, the starting point is not random because you have a transcription start site. So it is expected that you will actually have some points in the, in the transcriptome where things start uh, and reads pile, pile that way. So when you're thinking of removing or collapsing, keep that in mind. It's not something, it's not something that a lot of people do. Uh, a lot of people just leave it and they don't collapse. Uh, because by doing that, you can actually change the uh, expression profile uh, uh, of, of your RNA-seq. So uh, but if you're planning to do that, uh, we'll go over some QC metrics that you can, uh, you can use to assess whether or not you should actually collapse uh, your data. Um, the other question is, how much library depth is needed for RNA-seq? Um, so that's a very vague question when I get asked that, because it, it depends on so many different things. So it depends on what you're doing. Are you doing expression estimation? Are you doing mutation calling? Because each one of these will require a certain depth or uh, a certain number of lanes uh, that's different from the, uh, the other. Also depends on what kind of library you pick. So as we mentioned, there is total RNA, there is uh, mRNA, uh, have you done poly-A selection? Have you done uh, ribosomal depletion? Uh, because if you've done total RNA and you're only interested in coding, then you probably need uh, more depth compared to poly, uh, poly-A selected libraries. Um, uh, also depends on read length. How, how long do you want your reads to be now that there is more, more options? Uh, usually you do two by 100, but now you can go up to 150. Um, also, whether or not you're doing paired, most of the experiments nowadays, they're paired, uh, paired reads. Um, so th there are so many different factors. So when, one way you can, uh, you can deal with it is uh, by looking at a pilot experiment. So uh, do your research, look at what uh, uh, papers have uh, done, if they've done something similar, or they're interested in uh, uh, working on something similar to what you're working on. Uh, try to figure out in their method how many lanes of sequencing have they done per, per sample and try to do that yourself. So that's one way of, of dealing with that. Uh, one lane of sequencing nowadays I believe generates 600, 700 million reads. Uh, usually that's pretty sufficient to do anything that you want from uh, mutation calling to expression estimation uh, to fusion, fusion detection. Uh, but um, it could also be too much. So if you are if you're low on a budget and uh, you, you want to spend more, what you can do is you can multiplex. So you can pull uh, three, four samples uh, per lane. So you can cut it down to maybe 100 million reads per sample. Um, but again, I would look at uh, other publications and see what they have done and then try to copy that. That's one way. The other way would be to run a sample test. So just run one sample, full lane, and then analyze that and then see if you have enough information. Uh, and if that's not enough, you can go back and then scale it up and, and, and run that number that you uh, get from the first sample on everything else in your, in your pool. And there is a third method uh, that we'll talk about in the QC metric that you can use to, to estimate how much uh, depth you need. Um, the other question is what mapping strategy should I use for your RNA-seq? Um, and that's one of the reasons why I asked if you're dealing with samples uh, that have a reference genome. So if you don't have a reference genome, what you can do is you can do uh, assembly. Uh, for example, transit this would be a good tool to perform assembly. You don't really need a reference. Uh, but you do have, if you do have a reference, then uh, there are two options. You can either align it to a whole genome or you can align it to a transcriptome. Uh, today, we're going to be focusing on aligning to a whole genome. So taking RNA-seq data and aligning it to a whole genome to take into account the, uh, the gaps, intronic gaps. Um, <coughs> Um, I've talked about that, uh, so we're not doing we're not doing transcript uh, assembly here uh, outside the scope of this workshop. But that's that's something you can look into. All right, any questions about RNA seq? Just a general overview. No. Yes.
Yeah. So we'll we'll talk about that in part two. How how that actually works when you take RNA seq data that's spliced and you try to map it back to the whole genome uh, that has the introns. Uh, can I ask one more question on the, the cases that you mentioned? I mean, the one you know, just make the transcript blemish, for example, versus infusion. Uh, are there any rules of thumb in terms of like the lower bound or you know for reads that you need? Are you talking about the number of reads that is required? Yeah. Um, there, there, yeah, yeah. Again, it depends on the quality. So it depends on so many factors, like the quality of your RNA, uh, what, what you're doing. Uh, I'll show you uh, a method uh, down in the QC section that you can uh, use computationally to calculate approximately how many reads that you will need. But we'll cover that in a bit. Yeah. All right. So let's move to uh, uh, RNA uh, alignment. And here we're going to be talking about some of the challenges specific to uh, the alignment and then the alignment strategies. We, will, we have picked um, HiSat2. Uh, so previously in this workshop we used to do Top Hat, uh, but uh, a lot of people have switched over the past few years to HiSat. It's, it's a better performing uh, aligner and uh, a lot faster. Uh, so we'll talk, we'll talk about that, uh, and then we'll talk about the output of the alignment, the BAM file, which you've already seen, uh, and some BET formats, I don't know if you've, you've seen before, and then some how to do basic manipulation of RNA-seq BAM files and visualization in IJV. And then uh, the, I, I think the second part is very important, which is the alignment QC. So we'll w walk through some met QC metrics that you can either uh, do yourself or use tools that will generate it for you to help you figure out if your alignment is uh, proper or not. So at this point, um, uh, sorry, one, one second. At this point, we uh, uh, the o the only thing you can do in terms of QC, you can run fast QC. Have you guys used fast QC before? Okay, so you can run fast QC, and that will give you uh, an idea of how good the sequences are, uh, and that's you do that right before. Yeah, we, we run the alignment. So the alignment QC will just tell you how well uh, the, the sequences align back to your genome. But if you want to figure out if the sequences are good quality, then you can run TaskQC at this point before the element. Yes? Well, I said you uh, work with RNA-seq data from long reads? From long reads. I don't think so. I'm, I'm not sure, actually. I, but I don't think they uh, I don't think they do. I think 150 probably is the longest that you can, uh, you can do. Yeah. Yeah. The depth is not going to be yeah, the, the same, so it will be different. And I don't think it can handle reads that are that long, anyways. Yeah. <clears throat> so, some of the um, computational challenges that we face with RNA seq is that uh, as sequencing technology is advancing and it's getting cheaper and cheaper, we are generating more and more reads. So, uh, I have actually seen lanes of sequencing, uh, and this was maybe two, two years ago, that had uh, 900 million reads per lane. So that's a lot, a lot of reads that uh, you're going to have to, to process, and, and, and that comes at a computational cost. Uh, the other challenge uh, uh, that you mentioned uh, earlier is the introns. So the RNA-seq data that we have, uh, they are spliced, so they're only exons, uh, sequences of exons. And when we're trying to map them back to the genome, it's the uh, challenge of trying to split those and then map it back to uh, all these large uh, gaps of introns in the in the reference. Um, also, the fact that with RNA seq, it's unlikely that you're just going to do the uh, alignment once and you'll be done with it forever. Um, there are every few months there is a new annotation that comes out, a gene annotation that comes out, uh, new versions uh, of an aligner, and there are also so many tools uh, that will need to be rerun at the alignment level. So chances are you're going to be doing a lot of rerunning. Uh, and again, that comes out at a computational cost. Uh, in terms of HiSat, I mentioned HiSat is not the only uh, mapper that's available. There are so many other aligners, uh, and I'll leave you uh, a link so you can take a look at the other, other aligners. But aligners in general can be split into three classes. So you have the de novo assembly if you do not have a trans, uh, if you do not have a reference, uh, and then as I said, you have tools that would align to the transcriptome and then tools that will align to the reference genome. Um, we've mentioned that. So here is a list of um, 
some of the most popular aligners out there. They are not RNC specific, they are for uh, everything. And this is just a timeline that shows you the, the date that they were published. And um, I'll start with 2009 when Top Hat was published. And um, every tool that was, or every aligner that, that came after, tried to do three things. It tried to increase the accuracy of the mapping. It also tried to cut down on the time, processing time, and it tried to cut down on the memory, the amount of memory that each one of these tools use. So when Top Hat came out, it, um, it did not require a lot of memory. However, it took forever. So <laughs> one line of sequencing would, uh, so if you, if you look at 100 million reads, for example, uh, that would take a thousand hours, so that would take t days to process. And I'm sure people who here who have probably worked with Top Hat, they know what I mean. Um, it wasn't until uh, Star came out in 2013 uh, that introduced the idea of suffix arrays. So uh, you take the, the reference and you try to index it in a, in a way uh, that will speed up the process. So those thousand minutes for that hundred million reads became 23 minutes. So that was a huge transformation in terms of processing time. But that came at a cost of the, the, the memory. So now we require a lot more memory. I think it's 28 gigs uh, of, of memory that is required to store the index for that reference. So chances are you're not going to be able to run star on your local uh, machine. So that's, that's a challenge. And since then, um, uh, uh, Top Hat tried to compete and, and tried to come up with another version of the tool that would cut down on processing time. And they did that with Top Hat 2, but it was also, they also required high, high uh, memory. It was also about 28 uh, gig, and it matched the time. It was, about, it was done in about 20 minutes for 100 million reads. Um, but then the revolution come when HiSat uh, uh, High came out uh, in 2015, and uh, what they did is they uh, changed the way they were doing the indexing, and that reduced the memory to 4 gig. So for 100 million reads, you can actually run it in your machine. You can, it will take 20 minutes, and you don't require as, as much memory as uh, the rest of the, the tools. Top Hat was one of the first tools that I used, and I've used for a very long time. And that's because it had such a big community. And chances are, if you ever run into a problem, you will find an answer for it because so many people were using it. It might not necessarily be the best tool out there. And to this day, there are still people using Top Hat. Um, and I feel part of it is maybe they don't want to, you don't want to change your pipeline. You're just too used to the pipeline that you established. Uh, and also because of the, the big support that's available in the community out there. Uh, but I would highly recommend that you switch to HiSat, uh, HiSat, HiSat or HiSat 2, because uh, that improves the, uh, the quality of your, of your align, alignments. Yes? So are there lots of differences? And is it difficult to switch for, from, for example, HiSat 2 to HiSat? Why is it that people, they do not tend to do it? Yeah, it's not that difficult. Uh, I mean, uh, HiSat 2 is still using Bowtie. So Top Hat was using Bowtie as a backbone aligner. HiSat 2 is still using Bowtie 2 uh, as, as the aligner. But I think whenever you switch, um, you will have to run some tests like to compare your previous results to your current results. And I guess that, that's maybe time consuming. I don't really know why people aren't, aren't switching. It's not like the installation and uh, the instructions are very uh, straightforward. Uh, very similar to... Yeah, so I mean, you, you do have to install it again, uh, and then, yeah, but uh, it's, not, it's not that different from, from Top Hat 2. Uh, but also, also, it could be the fact that you probably have to reprocess everything you've done in the past, because you won't be able to, you'll have two batches of data that you process with Top Hat, and a batch that's probably high set, and maybe labs don't, they're trying to avoid that and just want to be consistent and run it on one thing. For sure, yes. Go with the latest. Go with the latest. <clears throat> so the next question is, um, should you use a spliceware uh, uh, aligner or uh, unspliceware? And the answer is pretty easy. If you're trying to map it to a whole genome uh, a reference, then you have to use a spliceware aligner. If you're mapping it to a transcriptome, uh, then you don't need a, a spliceware uh, aligner. But for the sake of this uh, uh, module, we're doing spliceware aligner, and we're focusing on, on HiSat. 
So how does HiSat uh, work? So HiSat, as I mentioned, uh, they, they, they managed to cut down on the processing time and on the memory by using uh, two types of uh, indexing. So the global indexing and the local indexing. So they take the reference and you can think of it this way. You can take the reference and you split it into bins. Um, so the global index, you're looking at the whole uh, genome. The local index is you're taking the, that whole genome and you're splitting it into 48,000 bins, and those bins are overlapping. And uh, what you're going to do is you're going to take the read and then try to look for it in the global index just to anchor it. So find a, a place where you can start. And once you anchor that read, you switch to the local index. And that, that reduces your search space by a lot. And now instead of looking at the whole transcriptome or the whole genome, you're only looking at a window or a bin in that whole transcriptome. So that really speeds up the time. You don't have to go through the whole uh, genome and look. So the way it worked before, Top Hat used to take the read, split it into chunks, two, three chunks, and then it would take each chunk and then it will look for it in the whole uh, genome. And that was very time consuming. That's why it took so long. Uh, but that has, has, has changed in HiSat too. So we're going to go through three examples to show you how this actually works. And the first example is uh, you, have, uh, you have a read and these are two exons and that's an intronic region between the two. So in this example we have a read that is fully contained uh, within one exon. In the second example we have a read that most of it is contained within the axon, but you have a, a, a small chunk that is uh, from X, the, the second axon. And then the third example, you have a read that is equally uh, uh, distributed to both axon 1 and axon 2. And then we'll walk through each case, each scenario, and I'll show you how, how HiSat actually does the mapping. So with the first, uh, first example, uh, I think the simulation that HiSat did, 60% of the reads that they did in their simulation uh, had that scenario where the, uh, the read actually is fully contained within, within an exon. Um, so as I mentioned, the whole, the whole uh, technique works by um, doing global search, local search, and extension. So you start with, uh, with that read. You, um, you first align it with the global index. So you look through the whole genome to try to find a, a, a starting position to anchor. And then once you find that, you, um, you align 28 bases uh, using the, uh, the local search, local bin, and then you do extension. So after you uh, align the first 28 bases in that read, the rest of it you just extend. Um, Now, if you look at the se uh, second scenario, we'll do the same thing. So we'll take the read, we'll look for it in the whole genome, and then we'll anchor it. And we will uh, map the first 28 bases, and then we will extend uh, using the local index. Extend, 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 until you get to the uh, first mismatch because of the intronic region, and then you stop. And when you find the, the first mismatch and you stop, then you move to, uh, uh, you look in that uh, space, the local space that you created, and then you uh, try to map the other, the rest of the eight bases. Uh, as I mentioned previously, this, you would have to go and look through the whole genome in top hat, and that was very time consuming. But here, you're only looking within that local space, and they're telling you what the local space is. They're saying the FM index is between this space and this space, so that's, it's restricting the search uh, within that within that space, uh, and it does that for all of for, for all of these. It does this per read. So if you have paired reads, it will do it independently for read one, and then it will do it for read two, and then it will take the the uh, alignment summary, and then it will put it together. Yes. Always just looking to the next axon, or all next axons. I think it depends on uh, how many what what axons uh, are within that local bin. Uh, that you're looking, you're looking at. Uh, so I, I don't know if we'll check all the axons within that that bin uh, or FM local FM index. And 
sorry. Finally, the, the, last, uh, the last scenario where you have a read that's uh, split between two axons, do the same thing. We are going to anchor uh, the beginning of the read. Uh, we'll map the first 28 bases, then do extension, then face the first uh, mismatch, look for, uh, look for the rest of it in the local index, um, only uh, map the first eight for the second part, and then do extension until you get to the end. Uh, and you do that for every single uh, read until you get uh, go through all the reads. Yes. That's a good question. I think it depends on how you run it. So uh, uh, for fusions, we're not going to be talking. We're not talking about fusions right now. We're only talking about the mapping. For fusions, you. Uh, you run the fusion command, and then I think you allow for a specific distance. Or, uh, 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 because here we have a maximum distance, and we say if it's if it's more than this, then uh, the discard or or don't don't use it. Uh, so the parameters are going to be different when you're running the fusion version of of high uh, You will relax those parameters to uh, take into account those reads. <clears throat> um, also, with DNA with DNA sequencing, um, you have the choice of uh, multiple uh, al multiply line reads. So those are reads that will m map to multiple locations in the genome with the same uh, quality. So what do you do with these? With DNA seq, we usually leave them. Uh, what you can also do is you can randomly just pick one of those reads and use it if all the reads have the same exact uh, mapping score. Um, but with uh, with RNA seq, um, you try you don't want to leave all these multiply mapped reads. Uh, what you want to do is you want to uh, get rid of them if you're doing expression. But if you're doing mutation calling, then maybe leave leave the uh, multiple multiple reads uh, in there because you don't want to affect the dynamic range of your expression by leaving all these multiply aligned uh, reads. Now, what is the output of, of, of HiSat2? It is a BAM file or a SAM file, and you've already seen uh, a BAM file. Um, and this is what it, what it looks, looks like. You have the uh, header uh, information that will tell you uh, the, the, the flow cell uh, that was uh, used to do the sequencing, will tell you the tool uh, that was used, the command, the actual command from HiSat that was used to run, uh, and uh, your, your sample, your library name, uh, and stuff like that. The, the body is uh, where the information is, the alignment information is, is contained, and it's taking every read in your FASTQ file, and it's just appending other information to it. So it's telling, it's telling you, okay, the first read in your FASTQ file is located on chromosome 2, uh, and I mapped it from this position to this position, and that's the quality uh, of the mapping, and so on. So every read that you input, you'll get a record and the output with more information about where it was uh, in, the, in the genome. Now, another format that you, you will uh, use a lot when you're dealing with RNA-seq is BET format. Um, so BET format is a text file that contains uh, the chromosome, start, end, and the name of the region. So it could be a gene name, for example. So it's a tab-limited file that has uh, these four columns, and you use that to subset BAM files. So let's say that you're interested in uh, a specific region or a specific gene or an exon in the BAM file, and you don't want to look at the whole BAM file. I just want to look at that region. So there are tool that, tools that will let you do that. So you pass it, you give it the BAM file, and you give it the uh, BET file, and you say, I'm looking at, I just want to look at this gene in that BAM file. And what it will do, it will generate a new BAM file, a smaller BAM file, that only contains reads from that segment that you specified. And that's very helpful um, if, you're, if you're using your local machine and you don't really want to uh, load, for example, the whole BAM file in IGV and you just want to have a small subset uh, and you want to look at that. If you want to look at specific mutations or uh, overlap mutation expression for a specific gene, you can, you can, you can do that with uh, BET. Uh, so here's a list of tools that you can use to combine BAM and BET. Um, SAM tools, VAM tools, the card, that tools. There are a lot of tools out there that you can uh, use for that. 
Um, sorting SAM and BAM files, there are two ways you can sort them. You can sort them by position or you can sort them by read uh, ID. And it really depends what you're trying to do. If you sort by position, it makes it easier to pull uh, uh, reads uh, out or certain co coordinates out. It's a lot faster that way. But if you're interested in keeping the order of the pair, uh, if you're trying to assess fusions, for example, uh, then it's, it's better to sort them by read ID <clears throat> or read name. Um, and we've already gone through IGV, so the BAM file you get from RNA-seq, similar to the BAM file you get from DNA-seq, you can still load it into uh, any IGV viewer, and uh, this is what you will get. You will get the uh, uh, transcript, um, oh, sorry, this is the gene track, and it's, it's, it's cool here because um, Unlike DNA-seq, where you actually had coverage for everything, with RNA-seq, you will only get coverage for exon islands. Um, so if you're looking at this gene right here, these, uh, these segments right here are, are represents exon, and then you will see pileup of reads only around these uh, exonic regions. And the introns, you should not be seeing uh, a lot of reads around the introns, unless your gene is not annotated properly, or you discover a new transcript that is not actually in the gene annotation. Then you might be seeing some, some reads. But if you do, then I would go back and check to make sure that the mapping worked uh, well and uh, you're using the right uh, reference, uh, GRCH38 and not 37. Yes? What sort of problem do you expect to work on the process on MRNA? Unprocessed? Yeah, incomplete. Uh, I mean, you do have DNA contamination, so that's that's possible. Uh, but I don't know. I haven't measured it uh, myself. Um, you should be able to measure that in, in any of the QC metrics. Uh, they will look at the uh, bases that are coding versus non-coding, and will tell you tell you the, the the DNA contamination as well. I don't know what fraction of the. Uh, I guess it depends on the library that you use. Uh, it will it will differ. The DNA contamination will differ. Yes? Do you use any of those pair information in the RNA the mapping? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it does the mapping separately, but it, then it consolidates the, the uh, information for the, for the pair. It does. And you will see in expression estimation, it, it is based on the, the pair. Because we're using the pair to assess how many fragments, to quantify the fragments. Uh, so the pair information is very important, yes. So we need it. I don't remember the last time I've seen single <laughs> single end, uh, but uh, I mean, you could, uh, but I think when you run it, you'll have to specify so that the, the high set does not expect a paired end. So we'll work with single end, um, but I don't know if we'll be as accurate. And instead of, uh, we'll talk about that in an expression, the unit that you get, instead of FPKM, you get RPKM. Uh, so you're, you're trying to estimate the fragments by looking at the reads, not the paired reads. Uh, so you, you can do that, but it's not as accurate. Can you define the use of fragments instead of reads? Yeah, so um, fragments is the cDNA fragment. So you know how you take your uh, RNA and then you split it into, uh, into pieces? You take the piece that's RNA and then you you trans you uh, uh, you convert it to cDNA, so that is a fragment. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to sequence that fragment. So you go 100 bases uh, one way and then 100 bases the other way. So that's what paired end it, uh, paired end is. So there could be multiple fragments to one mRNA, right? Multiple fragments More to fragments to make up one transcript. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, correct. Yeah. All right, so now that we have the BAM files, uh, the next step is to uh, do some QC assessment. And that is a huge part of, uh, of, of uh, if you're working in production, even if you're working on your own uh, data set, to figure out if, if the alignment went, uh, uh, if the alignments were successful, and if the uh, RNA seq sample is of good quality, and uh, and that you can move forward to do expression estimation. So this is a required step before that. So here is a list of some of the metrics that I'll be talking about today. Um, 
there is a lot more things that you can look up, but these are some basic things that you can maybe start with. So we we'll look at the three prime and five prime bias, uh, nucleated content, uh, base quality, PCR artifact, sequencing depth, base distribution, and insert size distribution. Um, so one of the uh, so it's, by the way, all of these plots are actually generated by a tool called RCC. Uh, and this is the link to the tool. It's um, pretty straightforward. All you need to provide it is a, uh, a gene annotation file and the BAM file that you have. And uh, it will generate all these uh, plots for you and you can take these plots and then put them in a report of your own. Uh, or you can use another tool to, to, to run these plots or you can even come up with these on your own once I tell you what each one uh, represents. So here what we're looking at, we are looking at the coverage, pretty much the coverage distribution. Uh, so how are the reads distributed across your transcript? Uh, are they evenly distributed or not? So the way that it does it, it takes your, it takes all the transcripts and then it um, bins them into 100 bins. And then for each one of these bins, it calculates the, uh, the, the, the coverage or the fraction of the reads that cover uh, that specific bin. And when you plot that, you will notice that uh, in here there are two groups of samples. So there is a group right here that seems to be evenly distributed, the coverage, across the transcript. But we're also seeing a group right here where there seems to be a very high coverage at the 3' prime end and then very low coverage at the 5' prime end. Any idea what might be causing this? So oligo-DT. Sorry? So the reverse transcription is oligo-DT? Uh, lo low quality? Is that, sorry? No. The reverse transcription was done with oligo-DT. Oligo-DT, okay. Um, any other ideas why? No? Um, one, one potential is uh, maybe you've, you've done poly A selection. And then poly A selection has a bias, the library that you picked will bias uh, the, the three prime end and any long transcripts, they will not capture the five prime end uh, of, of that, of the RNA. The other, the other possibility is that the RNA is uh, degraded and the degradation happens from the, the five prime end. Um, so these are just two possibilities that will uh, uh, make you go back and, and ask, why is this happening? So the first thing you would check is go back to the library and ask, okay, what library did you use? Was it poly A? Uh, can I go back and check the RIN? Was, was it low? Was the RNA degraded? And then you try to make all these correlations uh, and investigate what might have caused that. Now, this is a crucial step because um, if you're actually getting a mix of, of, of distributions, that is indicating that maybe there are two different types of libraries that you used or two different protocols. And you have to make a note of that because that will affect the expression downstream because these samples will not have the same expression as these samples. If you take the average, it will be a lot lower than these. And um, the, the tools that does expression estimation, they have no way uh, to tell. They don't do the QC for you. They assume that whatever you pass them is good quality. So one thing you can do if you get to this point, there are tools that will allow you to adjust for uh, computational tools that will allow you to adjust for these biases. Um, you just have to be very careful when you're dealing with them. Um, the other thing that you can do uh, besides going back and requesting to reprocess is flag them. So flag these samples so that when you're doing processing downstream, whether it's expression or differential expression, you don't want that to pop up as differentially expressed because that's an artifact. But if you mark them, uh, we'll talk about ways that we can actually adjust uh, in your model. When you fit the model, uh, whatever you're doing prediction, we can actually add that um, uh, and then we'll try to adjust for these differences that way. Um, the other thing that you can look at is the nucleotide content, and uh, what this is, uh, assuming that this is a 35 uh, base read, a very short read, uh, we look at each base in that read, and then we look at the fraction of ACGTs uh, in, that, in, that, in that base. And what you expect to see is you expect uh, equal chance, so 25% of it being uh, ACGT. There shouldn't be any preference to a, a certain base over, over the other. Uh, however, for some Illumina uh, sequencers, um, there seems to be a 
the, the, the random priming is not so random. It's kind of selective. Um, so what you end up having is you end up having uh, th these uh, weird fluctuations in the ACGT content for the first 10 bases of your uh, read. So any read that you look at, if you look at the composition, you realize that the first 10 bases, they have some messed up ACGT distributions. So check that. And if that's the case, that could actually uh, reduce the quality of your mapping um, because these are artifacts. So one way you can deal with that is you can uh, trim maybe the first 10 bases of your read and then uh, do one version with the full read, another version with the trimmed, and then check the quality of your mapping. And if, if it improves, then maybe trimming it is a good idea. Um, similar to what we had before, there's another plot where you can, for each base in your read, look at the uh, quality. So quality here is um, reported as a FRET score quality. So what is FRET score? Um, it's negative log 10 of uh, P. So P here is the probability that the base calling is wrong. Um, and a FRET score of 30 means that there's one in a thousand chance that the base calling is done wrong. So you, what you want is you want a higher number. So the higher the number, the less likely the base you called is wrong. Um, and one thing you can do is you can set a threshold. You can say, I only want bases that have uh, a FRET score of 30. So anything that is lower than 30, I will eliminate or I'll trim or I'll, I'll get rid of. Um, but look at the distribution uh, and then uh, set a limit. Here, everything is pretty, pretty high, like over 50. That, that's fantastic. So you don't have to do anything about it. But if it goes below, then you'll have to trim trim your read. And there are uh, tools that will allow you to trim based on fixed number of bases or quality uh, per base. What's the x-axis there? So the position of read? Sorry, x-axis? Yeah. So that's each base within your read. So if your read is 35 bases long, this is base 1, base 2, base 3, so and so on. the same as for DNA sequences? Pretty much. The lower quality, yeah, yeah. So uh, some of these metrics are very similar to DNA seq. Um, um, PCR duplication, so we mentioned that um, PCR artifact assessing them is challenging with RNA-seq compared to DNA-seq because the, uh, the starting points are not random. <clears throat> you have the trans transcription starting points. One way you can do it is uh, using um, uh, RCC. Uh, they have a function that would compare the sequences of your paired uh, uh, reads, and it looks at the position of the reads uh, beginning of the first uh, read and the end of the second read, and we'll also look at the sequencing, uh, uh, the actual sequence, and they try to match and see how many sequences have the same exact stand, start, and then same exact end, and the sequence itself is exactly the same. Those are likely to be uh, artifacts or duplicates, and uh, I think you asked a question about uh, whether or not you can have two or three duplicates. Uh, and that's exactly what you're checking here, is the uh, how, how many duplicates do you have, uh, the level of duplication, and this is uh, how, how many reads have that level of duplication. And what you want to do is you want a curve that actually is uh, like this, because you want to minimize the number of reads that have high duplication level. And you don't want anything that looks like this, because then that means that for high duplication levels, you have a very large number of reads that have that duplication levels. Um, so yeah, so look at this graph, and then if it's closer to what you're seeing right now, then that's probably good. If it's closer to this, then maybe uh, collapsing is a good idea. Um, sequencing depth. So we mentioned that uh, if you get asked how many lanes do I need? Uh, that you can check publications, you can run one sample and figure out if it's uh, good enough, but how will you know what's good enough? So one way where you can visually assess that is by running one sample and uh, taking subsets of that sample. So we have a BAM file. Uh, now let's take 20% of that BAM, BAM file, 40% of that BAM file, 50, 60, 70, 80, up to 100%. And in each subset, we look at the, all the, uh, the splice junctions, the known splice junctions and the new or, or novel splice junctions. And then we plot this plot. 
So here we have the novel junctions, we have the known junctions, and we have all junctions. And what we're interested in, we're interested in a point where it saturates, where adding reads is not adding any more information at the splice junction level. And at that point, you want to stop and say, okay, I'm, all these reads that I've added, I don't, I'm not really adding anything new uh, to my splice junction library. Now you'll notice that the, uh, the novel is increasing at a high rate, um, but the known is saturating earlier. And that's because there's a lot of false positive uh, splice junctions that are generated with whatever tool that you use. So um, it's, it's definitely not going to saturate at the same rate as your known. So I would go with other than known, um, or maybe a combination of both, and then figure out a point at which uh, it, it saturates. And then, so for example, the known, I would say maybe, I don't know, 60 or 70 percent is uh, a good point to stop. And then you say, okay, so how many reads is 60 percent of that bound file? And that's a good example where you can go back and say, okay, now for the rest of my samples, I will sequence this many uh, reads, I'll multiplex this many samples in one, one lane. Now this addresses the, so uh, RCXC does the uh, splice junctions. But if you think of it uh, in terms of uh, the number of new expressed genes, you can also do that. You can, at each subset, look at how many uh, uh, new uh, genes are you getting? How many new family of genes are you actually seeing in the expression uh, level? And is that changing as you change the subsets? And does that saturate? So from this point, you can actually look at so many different uh, things this way and do saturation plots that way to try to assess if you've uh, sequenced deep enough. Um, uh, another way uh, to assess is to look at the base distributions. So here I'm just looking at all the coding bases, uh, non-coding bases, UTR, Intronic, and uh, 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 Intronic will cover the, uh, the DNA bases, so that's the, the DNA contamination. Uh, and the composition will be different depending on what kind of library you pick. So if you picked a uh, whole transcriptome library that contains uh, ribosomal and tRNA, then the coding bases will be a lot less than uh, a poly-A library that should only select for mRNA. Um, so the, 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 the distributions will be different. But that's another way. If you've done uh, poly-A, but you see a very low coding and very high Intronic, then that's an indication that something went wrong at the library level. You report back to uh, the team and then try to figure out what happened at the library construction level. But wouldn't you, if you choose the poly A, wouldn't you expect to see no intronic bases? Yeah, you, you don't, but it happens. It, I mean, there is contamination in any uh, so protocol that you do. Yeah. 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 Yes. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. That's also a possibility, yes. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. Yeah, I. I think it really depends on the protocol. I guess that you use. Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure what uh, exact fraction or uh, you're expected to see for the non-splice. I can check for you though. But the, from the splicing, I think the splicing will happen quite fast. So the frequency of mRNAs are not there for that long. So the mRNA would be there for a long time. So you would have, therefore, you would have more. Yeah, yeah. Um, and going back to the fragment question, what do I mean by fragment? Uh, here we're looking at a cDNA. Uh, fragment, so that's what we're trying to quantify, and uh, the reads are reads. This is read one, read two, uh, so that's what you're trying to, uh, uh, to to read. So the fragment length uh, could be a lot longer than the sum of the reads. So the read could be 100, 100, 
but the, the fragment could be 300 bases. So that's what you select. You, you select your library size at the library construction level. So if you pick a, a, a library size or fragment size of 300, then you're going to have a, a gap of 100 bases between the, the two reads. And if you pick anything smaller, then these two are going to get closer to each other, read one, read two. And at some point, and I've seen that uh, a lot actually, if you pick a, a fragment size, I mean, fragment size is actually a distribution. You're not just going to get like all your fragments of the same size. It will come as a distribution. Uh, the mean, for example, is 300, but you will get some fragments that are 100 bases. You'll get fragments that are four or 500 bases. The ones that are 100 bases are very short. You will have overlap. So the reads, read one, read two are going to overlap. And that's not good because, uh, especially if, you, if you're doing uh, mutation calling, because then it will, you will count two reads as two reads coming from two different fragments. They're actually coming from one fragment. So you're really biasing uh, towards that fragment and you're counting it as uh, two records when it's only one, it should be one record. So try it whenever you're... Increase your sensitivity. Sorry? If you have an overlap, then you have a second read also telling you that that's a C and not a T. A second read coming from, from the same fragment though. What you want is you want a second read coming from a different fragment that will, that will uh, uh, increase your 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 uh, sensitivity um, because there could be a problem with that with that fragment that you're, you're sequencing right we want it to come from a different uh, a different one so you can have all these overlapping reads what's the normal average size of the fragment? it's i mean it's increasing now with the increasing read length so if you're doing 150 right you have to increase it a bit but um 400 500 600 it really depends on what you're trying to achieve, but uh, just don't, if you're doing two by 100, try to go over 300, or like around 300, don't go lower. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I think this slide was intended to show that you can actually, uh, just like you, you do with uh, DNA-seq, you can actually use RNA-seq to call variants. So you can load it in IGV if you uh, have a gene that you're interested in or a specific position that you've already uh, pulled out from your DNA seq and you want to validate. Well, validate, but you just want to see if it actually is present at the RNA seq level. You can go in IGV and pull that specific position and then look at the uh, at the at the change to see if it's there. Um, you can also run uh, variant callers. I'm not sure if there are variant callers that are specific to um, RNA-seq data, or if you can use variant callers that are DNA-seq and, uh, and just run RNA-seq BAM. You'll have to be very careful, though, because the error profile is very different <clears throat> in RNA-seq versus DNA-seq, especially around the splice junctions. So if you're assembling splice junctions, you will notice that there will be a lot of false positive mutations, or SNVs, around the splice junctions, just because the uh, that could indicate that the splice junctions were not done properly, and they will have mismatches around there. So if you plot the error rate, you'll see uh, uh, peaks around the splice junction that you have to account for, or filter uh, when you're processing. All right. Yes. If you compare, let's say, DNA with RNA as far as mutation detection yeah. is concerned, wouldn't you expect that because the polymerase, the RNA polymerase is lacking in the capabilities of uh, you know, error correction that the DNA polymerase has, wouldn't you expect to find more mutations in the RNA, not more like a you know, variants? So yes, so one, one way uh, uh, to find more variants, just like I said, the spice assembly, but also there is RNA editing, uh, which is a field of research right now too. Uh, so you will you will see more uh, mutations and and the fact that it's if it's not in the RNA it's not really a validation like you you actually do have to perform validation of your DNA uh, mutations uh, but combining the two gives you a better idea of the consequence of these mutations and not whether or not they're present if they're present then that's great but if they're not that's not doesn't mean that it's not at the DNA level. All right, how are we doing in terms of time? <clears throat> cool.
cool. So let's um, quickly do the expression differential expression, and then we can um, maybe take a, a break, and then we will jump into the hands-on exercise and do some alignment and expression estimation. Um, so now that we have um, checked the quality, uh, done the alignment, checked the band files, and we made sure that everything is great, the band files look great, uh, it's time to move to the estimation or expression estimation. Um, and we are uh, here. We're going to be covering some. Uh, we're going to talk about FPKM. If you're familiar with that term, versus uh, raw counts, uh, some differential expression methods, and then the downstream uh, interpretation uh, that you can you can do with that data. So one way you can uh, assess differential expression. It's a very naive way. Is again loading the two conditions in IGV. And then uh, trying to just visually assess the differences. So, uh, for example, if I load uh, a tumor BAM uh, and a matched normal BAM, and I am looking at the same region, and uh, I'm, I'm comparing the, uh, the the pileup of the reads between the two conditions, and I, I, I notice by looking at it, I notice that there are very high coverage for all these exons for that gene, but then I look at this condition and I see a very low uh, uh, coverage. So I think right over here, I'm not sure if you can see, that will give you the range of how many reads within that window, the maximum number of reads within that window. So, and then you jump to the conclusion and you say, well, okay, this gene is down, definitely down-regulated. I can see it, it's very clear. Uh, do you see any problem, any problems with that? Yes? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So um, you, by doing it this way, we're uh, we're not looking at uh, uh, the coverage distribution, and we're not even looking at how deep we've sequenced. So maybe here I did uh, ten samples in a lane. Maybe here I did one sample in a lane. That information is not available here, and I'm jumping into the wrong conclusion by just visually looking at that without actually normalizing somehow for how deep did I go uh, and what the, the gene length uh, is. Here I'm looking at the same gene, but imagine that I, I'm trying to compare two different genes. Of course, if there is a longer gene, it will have more reads, so uh, that will cover it. So by just counting the number of reads, that's not sufficient. It's not a fair comparison uh, if I'm comparing a, a short gene versus a long gene or if I'm comparing the same gene between two patients that have two different library depths. So that's where um, RPKM, FPKM uh, fit into the, the picture. So RPKM stands for Reads Per Kilobase of Transcript Per Million Mapped Reads. And FPKM, same thing, but it's fragments. Um, so, wait, I don't know if this slide oh, it's, uh, explains it here. So, um, uh, again, in RNA-seq, the basic idea is that the relative expression of transcript is proportional to the number of cDNA fragments that origin originate from it. And as I said, there are two limitations. Uh, they're biased towards larger genes, and they are biased towards uh, total library depth. So to correct for them, um, what you do is, for FPKM, you... Um, you sum all the fragments, or all the, the reads, uh, and then you divide each gene by the total number of reads, so the total number of reads in your library, and then you divide by the, given that, that value, divided by the length of the gene. So you're kind of normalizing for two things. You're normalizing for the length of the gene and for how many reads you've sequenced. And that, by doing that, now it's a fair comparison. You can go back and compare because you've normalized by these two things. You can compare the samples or you can compare the, the genes. Now, there's another um, unit called TPM, and the way this one is calculated is very similar, it's just the order is different. So the first thing you do with TPM is you divide by the length of the gene first, and then you take that and then you sum it and you divide by the sum of that. So you, you're accounting for both the length of the gene and the total depth, but the order is different. Um, and that can actually, the, the consequences of that order, it makes a, it makes a difference because uh, it's, 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 a, it's a more fair comparison to use TPM to compare uh, a gene between samples because it gives you a better idea of the total proportion of reads 
that uh, cover that specific gene. And you can use that proportion. The, the total of the proportion is always uh, one. So you can use that proportion to compare uh, uh, samples, same gene, different samples. Now, now that for each gene, you calculate that normalized unit, which is FPKM or TPK, uh, TPM. What we can do is um, uh, string tie. I'm not going to get into the details of how exactly string tie works, but uh, what what string tie does is that it uh, it, it generates these uh, uh, splice graphs. So you can think of them as networks of all the possible combinations of of exons that could happen. So it will take your expression values and it will take your uh, coverage distribution uh, for for those regions and it will try to come up with the probability that that read fits into that hypothesized transcript uh, structure. And uh, it will assign the read to that, the, 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 the transcript that has the highest probability. And then once it does that, then it eliminates it from the pool and then goes back to the pool of reads and then takes each read and then finds the probability of it actually fitting with that, within that, uh, that graph. And after it comes up with all these hypothetical uh, uh, transcripts, then uh, there is a function called string time merge that will merge all the possible transcripts that you generated for all the different samples. And it's just a way of uniting all these transcripts. And then it goes back to each sample and it tries to recalculate the expression for every single one of these transcripts, the union of all these transcripts, just to be consistent uh, across all the samples within, within your pool. <clears throat> uh, there's another function called GFF compare that takes a GTF uh, file. So uh, GTF file is just a file that lists um, all the, the exons and all the possible uh, transcripts that are known. Um, and you can actually, uh, when you're doing, when you're doing this, the expression estimation, you can uh, tell the tool string tie to either do it on its own, or you can provide it with annotate, uh, annotated uh, transcripts. Say, these are annotated transcripts for humans. Uh, um, you use this as a guide or as a reference. So it will uh, go through these transcripts and then as, try to assess the expression for each one of them. And then if it finds anything novel, it will add it to the list. Uh, but if you, you can also run it in a mode where you don't give it any um, reference transcripts or GTF, and it will try to discover everything on its own. The false positive rate will probably be higher if you do it that way, uh, but you, it's, it's, your, it's your choice. Now, um, ball count is the name of the tool that is used. So string tie does the uh, expression uh, estimation. Now, ball gown does the differential expression. So um, you can, I mean, previously, I think you can just use a t-test to uh, compare the two different conditions. Because ideally, what you're trying to do is you're trying to compare uh, the distribution of expression from condition one to the distribution of expression in condition two. And if these two distributions are very different, then the gene is differentially expressed. Uh, but the problem with t-test is that you can only use one value, which is just the expression. And you just check how the distributions are different. Um, with with ball gown, they they introduced uh, uh, some sort of a linear model where the outcome is the expression that you're trying to uh, the, the, for each gene the expression for each gene that's the y that you're trying to predict, and the uh, and you fit two you fit two models one model where you fit the condition as a, a covariate so whatever condition you're trying uh, to assess cancer versus normal, and then you can also fit as many features as you want uh, whether you know that there was a problem with the um, distribution. There was a bias at the beginning. So you can say group one, group two, uh, uh, coverage bias, no coverage bias. You can put the, uh, the, the, the sex, you can put the age, whatever you think is uh, going to be able to distinguish the, the two classes, you put it in that model. And then you compare the, f the fit of the two models, the one that has the condition and the one that doesn't have the condition. And if the... The one that where you apply the condition fits better, then that tells you that the, the, they're differentially expressed. That means that adding the condition is actually improving the fit of your model, so the genes are actually differentially expressed within these conditions. So uh, what you get uh, out of that, you get a, an F, F test score and you get a p-value. And that's what you're 
using to assess uh, or, or subset the genes that are differentially expressed. You use the p-value from that test uh, to, to do that. Um, and it's also important that you adjust for multiple testing, because you can imagine you're doing this per gene. So we have 20,000, 30,000 genes, so we're doing 20,000 tests. You can also do this at the exon level, so that will increase the pool of tests that you, you have to do. So when you do so many of these tests, by chance, you're expected to see something significant. So what you need to do is you need to adjust for all these multiple tests that you're performing uh, and only pull the ones that are significant after adjusting for multiple testing. Um, so after that, you can subset the 20,000 genes to maybe a list of 100 genes that have significant p-values after adjustments uh, and maybe have a good um, uh, fold, uh, uh, fold difference, a fold ratio. And, um, and then use that subset to do uh, downstream visualization. So you can look at uh, box plots of the expression for that gene across different samples. You can uh, compare across different conditions and then uh, visually assess the, the expression differences between uh, the two and maybe generate heat maps, do some clustering. Um, so that's, sorry, yes. Yes, but we'll talk about that. Edgar and DSeq, they're using, they're not using FPKMs. So the underlying distribution of the score that you're testing is different. Yeah, this is using FPKM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. FPKM or TPM. Um, so HR and DSeq, so these are two different tools that would also do uh, differential expression, but they use um, raw counts. So they're, base, they're basing it on the, the, the first point that we discussed earlier. Before you do any normalization, you're just taking the raw counts. And because the underlying distributions are different, then um, the, the tests that you can do there are, are pretty different. So to get the, the raw count, what you can do is you can use a tool called HTSeq. And um, you, uh, you, you, you pass it, uh, it will give you a table uh, that has the, the raw count for each one of, of these genes. And then you take these raw counts and you pass them to EdgeR or DSeq, and they will do a different set of, of tests to assess how differentially expressed these genes are. Now, which one should you use? Uh, it really depends on uh, what you're interested in. If you are interested in just looking at full changes, generating heat maps, um, anything, anything visual, then I would highly recommend you do uh, FPKM. If you're doing something that is uh, way more statistically advanced, you're doing modeling, uh, uh, then it's it's better to go with the ca with the counts because you have more flexibility there. You can apply more tests there uh, that you cannot apply with uh, FPKM uh, values. Um, and sometimes you can do is um, if you really want to narrow it down to a list of genes that you want to carry on to a validation maybe, uh, and you have a giant list of genes that you get from whatever, FPKM tests or your edge R and DSeq. Um, it's interesting that you, you can also maybe do a, a Venn diagram and try to see uh, what genes are significantly different in all of these tools that you've run. Because running these tools is not computationally intensive because you're dealing with uh, very small files at that point. You're just dealing with small matrices of counts. So you can you can run the three algorithms and then look at the overlap. I mean, that doesn't the, the overlap doesn't mean that these are uh, this is the only truth. Um, it is likely that you'll be missing out on some. Uh, for example, maybe edge R is doing better than the other two and it's calling things that are unique and they are still correct. Uh, but it's just it's just one way of reducing that space into a smaller a smaller space that you can actually then carry on for for validation. Uh, but that's just one one way of doing that, one way of reducing that space. I've talked about multiple test correction, um, and I believe the packages in R for string tie they do have. They do have that option where you can uh, adjust for multiple testing, so you don't have to worry about about it yourself. Um, so, in terms of 
downstream, sorry, downstream interpretation, what you can do now is you can take those expression values, you can perform clustering, uh, so unsupervised uh, uh, machine learning, for example, uh, try to cluster and then figure out if there are different conditions within the, the samples that you have. Uh, you can do classifications, you can do some supervised uh, uh, machine learning, uh, you can use random forest uh, if you want. Uh, you can also use pathway analysis, there are so many different tools that you can uh, use for that. The, the choices are unlimited once, once you, get, you go down that, that path uh, in terms of modeling and uh, biomarker discovery. Thank you.